this is where our operators um, are monitoring and managing over 5,000 megawatts of renewables across the United States. How would this differ from like a conventional asset monitoring center? Yeah, so assets, uh, historically, mm -hmm. they would have the monitoring center on site. So okay. you might have an operator with screens, but at the site. Whereas this, we can do 90 sites. There's offshore wind, onshore wind, uh, solar, and they're looking for the smallest change in output because mm -hmm. every megawatt hour is money. You put an asset in, let's say it's 100 megawatts, mm -hmm. right? You expect to get 100 megawatts each and every hour that the resource is there. The resource could be sunshine or it could be wind. And when you get 90 or 80, you, you're, you're not producing what you can. And it, it can be because the asset isn't, isn't working properly. Maybe, maybe something hit the turbine blade on the wind farm. Maybe the solar panel has debris on it. Or it could be the solar intensity is not quite there. When one of these assets isn't producing full capacity, we're putting another resource on and we're having to toggle this mm -hmm. on a consistent basis. And, and this, as clouds come, it's this is by the minute. This is not, uh, or oh, the hour it's off. No, it's by the minute. And then it'll, it'll fall, come back. And we have assets that follow this um, digitally as well so that we can keep a consistent flow of electrons on the grid. The operators in this room can respond to incoming data with immediate action, remotely controlling wind turbines, solar panels, and batteries. It's another example of using digital and technology tools to make us more efficient, to make us more productive, minimizing the amount of people we have to have running around and observing, and giving us the statistics to really be able to maintain and monitor those uh, facilities. Uh, we couldn't see degradation in output as fast as we do now with the technology and the digitalization of, of the, the system. Now we still need technicians nearby. Mm -hmm. And so we use traveling crews that can go, um, say, uh, sites in Kansas versus sites in, in South Texas versus Central Texas and, and across the West. We have round the clock shifts, but about 20 people rotate through these shifts. And again, we're covering 90 sites. We got about half a dozen people here uh, at any given time managing it. You could think that would scale at over time as renewables grow in the United States. So would you say that as you invest more in renewables, it's a hardware thing or a software thing? Like where do you think you're going to spend the most money doing that? Obviously the software will continue to improve yeah. over time and the sensors on the equipment are very important to, uh, again, identify those degradations in output. But it's deploying the hardware, deploying the assets on the ground, getting the sites ready, connecting them to the to the grid is is a huge lift. Duke's hardware and software mix keeps evolving, and so does its workforce. Retooling also means retraining. We've moved people to the renewable space. Mm -hmm. Some of these folks used to be in coal. We've moved people to cybersecurity, which is a growing area that we need more and more because as everything gets digitized, there's more opportunities for bad actors to penetrate. So we need high cybersecurity skills, and when you match that with operating skills, you really have a beautiful mix that makes it a strong, strong uh, operator. Operators here have plenty of micro details to keep track of, but there's a macro factor on their minds as well. That's the weather. We have maps of the United States just are gonna give the operators a bearing of what's going on in the country. And we have plotted on it where our renewable sites are, so they know if, if there's a weather pattern, weather system coming, I expect that in that, mm -hmm. in that area. How do you manage extreme weather? So let's say we have a wind farm in the west and, and a wind storm is coming. Yeah. You know, the assets will turn off when the wind speeds exceed a certain level automatically. Okay. Um, because there's, there's risk of, of uh, breakage of the blades and, and damage to people and assets uh, and, and, and stuff. If we know a wind storm's coming that, that might damage the solar or a, a, a hail storm, for instance, right? Um, we can watch those assets closer, we can put a crew on site, uh, but this team would be dispatching those crews on, onto the uh, location. And that's where like the weather map and the team like really works together. That's right. From hurricanes in the southeast to wildfires in the west, extreme weather events are becoming more prevalent and more intense. Utility companies are bracing for greater risk. When we think about the impacts of extreme weather events on the grid, large grid connected resources would still, such as large scale solar farms and large scale wind farms, would still rely on a centralized grid to deliver electricity to 
the load centers. So to the extent that the grid is knocked out by a hurricane, those assets would go offline as well. So in addition to investing in uh, green generation resources, it is extremely important that companies pay attention to grid hardening measures. We're seeing more of it, mm -hmm. more frequency of, of uh, severe events and how we predict those, monitor those, and, and estimate the damage using data analytics and machine learning to say, how many customers might be out if this happens, what generators are at risk, and all that, that modeling goes into our planning for what we put our investments. We talked about the capital plan earlier. All those investments are informed by the climate uh, trends that we see across our system.